You know, I think heraldry just might be my favorite part of fantasy world building. There's just something really satisfying about a cool coat of arms, you know? Do you like making coats of arms for your world? Do you want to learn how? Let's pull the blackboard out. I'll show you. Now, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to heraldry, so we're going to follow this list here on screen so that we don't get lost in the weeds. Heraldry broadly refers to all the duties of a herald. These are many, but for now, you probably want to know about all the cool shields and how they work. In this sense of the word, heraldry is the art and science of creating an artistic and unique design meant to identify the owner. Art, because there is a great deal of creativity involved. Science, because there are strict rules to be followed, as well as a few principles to abide by. How did heraldry come about? Well, lucky for us, I happen to have a copy of John Trevor's Book of Arms. Or, as it's called in Welsh, Llyfr Arfo. This is a 14th century guide to heraldry that ought to give us a good idea of this honourable occupation's pedigree. According to Bishop John, Arms were first born after the time of the Flood, when the heavenly four-coloured ark appeared, which is called the Rainbow, and which is visible against the sun through a dark cloud, and these four colours are produced from the four substances from which are created all things, namely fire, air, water, and earth. The red colour from the fire, the ruddy colour from the sky, green from water, and dusty black from earth. Ah, yes, the four colours of the rainbow. Red, gold, green, and black. And though the origin of arms may be traced to this time, yet they were not much used until the time when the Greeks came to fight against Troy, to avenge the rape of Helen of the spot. It was then that the Trojans of royal blood adopted distinctive colours, that they might be recognised from the walls and their deeds and prowess in combat be noticed. And where colors failed them because there was not enough of them, they introduced into the colors the forms of animals, fishes, birds, and other things. Alright, perhaps we don't want to just take a medieval writer's word for the history of this. So what can we actually know about the history of heraldry? Quite a bit, actually. And where we don't know, we can make very educated guesses. Bishop John Trevor's claim about the Greeks isn't a bad guess, after all, they do have designs on their shields, but nothing in Greek writings or archaeological evidence suggests that the shield designs were unique to the wielder, and they certainly weren't governed by laws about who could use what. Over in Britain, we know that shields were also being painted in the early Middle Ages, with artifacts like the Bayeux Tapestry giving us a glimpse at some of the designs used, but even this still isn't heraldry. Heraldry is a concept likely originated with banners on the battlefield, as battle became larger and larger entering the 10th century, the need for a rallying point, or at least some way to figure out where the general went, became a greater concern. So people started creating flags with simple designs on them, so you could tell where everybody went, or at least where all the important people went. Noblemen began to make banners for themselves, and even France had the Oriflamme, an unusually shaped red banner that was pretty hard to mistake. By the time of the 11th century, tournaments were becoming more commonplace, though they looked nothing like what probably comes to mind when you hear the word tournament. These were mock battles, where you could capture and ransom other noblemen on the field, which not only got you money, but also bought fame and glory. This need to know who you were about to fight, and if he's on your side, helped push along a movement to paint shields and tabards, this thing here, with a unique design. So, you have a coat, with the same painting of your shield. A coat of arms, if you will. This doesn't mean that your banner and your arms are the same. In fact, there are a great many examples of arms and flags that don't match whatsoever. The arms of France, both versions, have no resemblance to the Oriflamme. That said, the rules of banners wound up being applied to coats of arms, partly because of their overlap in use as a signifier on the battlefield, and probably in large part because of tradition. Keep in mind that only the nobility could have a coat of arms. Your coat represented you and you alone. In most places, the coat could be passed down to the eldest son, but nobody else, with some limited exceptions. Families didn't have a coat of arms, usually. So when you see those find your family coat of arms here things, it's either a scam or someone who just doesn't care about the truth. I'm looking at you, Crown and Crest. In order to learn how heraldry works, we're going to need to know what everything is called. For starters, this is not a coat of arms. This is called the Armorial Achievement. This here is called the Crest. This is the Wreath. 
This is the mantling. This is the helm. This stuff is the compartment. The motto goes on the motto scroll. The things supporting the shield are called supporters. And this is the arms. If someone says coat of arms, this is what that refers back to. Now, let's talk about the arms, starting from the bottom and working our way up. The simplest part of a coat of arms are the tinctures. Tinctures are the colors used in the coat of arms. Tinctures can be broken into three groups, metals, colors, and furs. That's right. All colors are tinctures, but not all tinctures are colors. And if you say color, you're not actually talking about the colors on the shield, you're talking about a group of colors that are part of a group called the colors that are part of a group of hues called the tinctures. Confused? Here's a picture. Metals are gold and silver. Colors include green, red, blue, purple, and black. However, all of the names are taken from Anglo-Norman, so they're all old and Frenchish. And, of course, they've been anglicized over time. So, with no guarantee that these are the correct pronunciations, the metals are ore and argent, the colors are ver, gules, azure, purpure, and sable. There are also furs. The name fur derives from how some of them look like fur coats. Ermine looks like a royal cloak with ermine tails attached. Ver looks like a cloak of squirrel tails, the word ver referring to a type of blue-gray squirrel fur. Other furs include ermines, ermenois, pin, potent, counterpotent, counterver, and so many others. There are more tinctures, but deciding whether they are metals or colors can change depending on the circumstances. Some of these tinctures appear earlier than others, but all are fairly unusual. You have Cendre, Blue Celeste, Tenay, Murray, and Sanguine, those last three are called stains, as well as several other colors that only appear once or twice in heraldry. Now, moving on to the shield, the first thing we have is the field. That's the face here. The left side of the shield, as you hold it, is sinister, which just means left-handed. And the right side as you hold it is dexter, which just means right hand. That means it's backwards when you look at it. This side over on the right is sinister, and this side on the left is dexter. The top is the chief, the bottom is the base. There are also three points where we can place things. Honor point, fest point, and nombril point. You can also partition the field, splitting it into different sections. Most partitions are named after an ordinary, and we'll get to ordinaries in a bit. Partitions are normally written out as party per, and then the name of the partition. Examples include quartered, per pale, per paul, per bend, per fess, per chevron, and per saltier. When you partition the shield, each section becomes its own field, and gets its own tincture. This is helpful when considering the rule of tincture, which we'll cover in part 4. Some of these, like per bend, can be done in one of two ways, the normal way or sinister, where the top starts in the sinister of the shield instead. Other divisions of the field, such as per chevron, can be done inverted. So you do it upside down, like this. Instead of partitions slash divisions, another way to break up the shield is to use a treatment of the field. A treatment of the field is made up of a regular pattern, and it uses two tinctures, one metal, and one color. This treatment is considered a tincture all on its own. Again, because of the rule of tincture, but don't worry, that'll make sense in a bit. Common treatments include Checky, Lozengi, Bendy, Polly, and, again, so many others. If you want to put something on the shield, you have ordinaries and charges. Ordinaries are big shapes that go across the whole shield. Usually. There are a few that don't. Examples of ordinaries include a chief, a cross, a pall, a pale, a bend, a fess, or a chevron. Like with the partitions earlier, some of these can also be done sinister, like the bend, or inverted, like the chevron. Certain ordinaries can also be made extra small. For instance, you bendlets, which are just extra thin bends, and chevronelles, which are just really thin chevrons. If you want to get fancy, you can change up the borders of partitions in ordinaries with special edges called lines. I know, very creative. There are a lot of lines, not even counting the modern ones. Some of the more common ones would be density, wavy, nebulae, indented, or embattled. Now for charges. These are the symbols that you put on the shield. These can be anything you want, from a castle to a syringe, and normally you just call it by its name. There are some that have old names though, these are generally geometric shapes. Lozenges are these diamonds, and elongated ones are called fusels. A star or rather the shape that you normally think of when you hear the word star, is a mullet. Usually. 
and if you want more than five points, you just say so when describing it. A six-pointed star would be a mullet of six, for example. A small rectangle, like this, is a billet. A circle is called a roundel, but some tinctures, most of them actually, have a special name for it. A roundel or is a bezant. A roundel argent is a plate. A roundel azure is a hurt. A roundel gules is a torteau. A roundel ver is a palm. A roundel purpure is a gulp. A roundel sable is a pellet. A roundel tene is an orange. And a roundel sanguine is a guse. There's also an extra special version of roundels. If you have a roundel that's wavy, argent, and azure, you call it a fountain. And then there's crosses. There are so many crosses. Too many if you ask me, I can't keep track of them all. And they all have their own special name. There's something else you can do with this charge, and that's called a semé. A semé is when you take a bunch of small charges and you just throw them across the field like this. Usually you couldn't say a semé of this, and that's good enough. But again, some of them have special names, depending on the charge you use. If you have a semé of billets, that's billity. If you have a semé of fleurily, that's flority. A semé of mullets is mullity. A semé is a kind of treatment of the field, so it follows the one color and one metal rule from earlier. You can also have these rules with furs if you want to do a strange color palette. For example, you could have gules, airmond, argent. The other furs just throw a Y on the end, like most heraldic adjectives. Ver becomes very, potent becomes potenty. You get the idea. If a charge or ordinary is placed over top of a shield so that different parts of it are in different parts of a division, then you have one more option for tinctures. You could give the charge its own tincture, or you could counterchange it. Counterchanging means each part of the charge in one section of a division has the color from the other section of the division. In practice, it might look something like this. Now, I haven't even come close to naming all the lines, partitions, ordinaries, and charges you can put on a shield, and if I did, we'd be here forever. If you're interested in a continuation research guide with more of this, as well as advanced concepts like impalement, demediation, bendwise orientation, and what it means to have a charge voided, let me know in the comments below. For now, let's move on to the rules of heraldry. The first rule of heraldry is the rule of tincture. What's the rule of tincture? Metal does not go on metal, and color does not go on color. This rule almost certainly began for practical reasons. It's easier to distinguish between a bright color and a dark color on a flag when you're very far away, so you take white and yellow, which are fairly bright, and you split them up from the other colors, which are relatively dark. But burrs, I hear you cry. Surely there were exceptions! There were, but they were rare. A famous one is the coat of arms of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but they got away with it because, one, heraldry had only just started, so the rules were pretty fast and loose, and two, Silver and gold are both very valuable metals, so of course the kingdom of God gets to have both. There is one other exception, and that is when a charge is displayed in its naturally occurring state, which is called proper. A tree proper has a brown trunk and green leaves. An apple proper is red. If you have an apple tree proper, it will have a brown trunk, green leaves, and red apples on its leaves. Even though red and green are both colors, this is okay, because the charge's tinctures are proper. You might remember I said when you make a treatment of the field, you use one metal and one color. This is because a metal and a color together are considered heraldically neutral when it comes to the rule of tincture. It is neither metal nor color. You can put anything on top of it, and you can put it on top of anything. Okay, well maybe not anything. You probably shouldn't put it on top of another treatment, but that's because of another tradition we'll come to in a moment. If you have an ordinary on the shield, then it must be the opposite of the field and any charge on the ordinary would be the opposite of that. So if you have a field of sable, you could have a chevron argent, but not gules. And then you could have, say, a mullet gules on the chevron, but not a mullet or. I also mentioned earlier that each section of a partitioned field is its own field, so to speak. If you have a shield party perfess, you could make both halves a color, or both halves a metal if you wanted. All that would matter is that whatever goes on each part is still following the rule of tincture. I cannot stress this enough. The rule of tincture is king. The other rule of heraldry is the blazon. A blazon is the sentence that describes the image, and it is this, in fact, that is the most important part. You can draw out the shield in whatever style you want. What matters is whether it depicts the blazon correctly. While there can be certain parts of a more complex design that can be described and 
more than one order or manner. The basic rule is to start with the field, and any treatment or partition of it, and then describe anything on the field, making sure to describe ordinaries first, and then the charges. Then you describe anything on top of the ordinary or ordinaries. The blazon for this lovely coat, held by Sir Francis Drake, is blazoned as Sable, a fess wavy between two stars, Argent. You might note that these are called stars. The shape here is usually called an estoil, but some traditions don't have a difference between mullet, estoil, and star. It's just something you have to get used to. You may also have noted that I named the tincture of the fess after the stars. You're supposed to name the tincture last, and everything before that tincture is assumed to be the same. Here's another example, the arms of one Samuel Pepys. Sable, a bend or, between two horses' heads erased, argent, and on the bend, three fleur de lis of the field. Erased, by the by, just means the charge looked like it was ripped off. So, a horse head erased means it looks like you tore the horse head off the body. Pleasant, right? You can say of the field if you want the tincture of something to match the field's tincture, as you probably guessed. You might do this if you had a field gules, then a bend or, then you wanted a sheaf of wheat in sinister chief, also or. So, this. You could blazon it, gules, a bend or, and in dexter chief, a sheaf of wheat of the last. Beyond this, there aren't any hard and fast rules of heraldry, though there are certainly different customs depending on where you are. However, there is a sort of common sense tradition, and it's one that will keep you from getting too crazy with treatments on treatments on treatments. The idea of debased heraldry. Debased heraldry is, put simply, a coat of arms that just has far too much going on. For example, these are the arms of Horatio Nelson. I know, they're hideous. The earlier version looked just fine. To some extent, what heraldry counts as debased is a matter of taste, but as a general rule of thumb, it's better to avoid having too much on the same shield if you can. Alright, that should be everything you need. And just like how there's more to talk about with ordinaries and charges, there are other rules we could cover here, like augmentations, differences, and what the rules are for marshalling arms. But those are more advanced ideas, and you can get along perfectly fine without them. Maybe I'll cover them in a part two if this video does well. For now, let's see what we've learned in action. For our examples, we're going to pull from Glover's Roll, a British roll of arms from the 13th century. For these first three, I'm going to give you the shield. You can pause the video and try to figure out what the blazon should be. Then I'll give you the answer. For the second three, I'll give you the blazon, then you try and figure out what the shield might look like. Afterwards, I'll give you an image of one way you might draw out the shield. Ready? Okay, here's shield one. This one is blazoned, gules, three fleur de lis, or. Here's shield two. This one is very, or and gules. When you have a fur or treatment like this, the tincture in Dexter Chief is named first. Here's shield number three. This one is quarterly, oars and gules. A bend, gules. You could also say quartered if you wanted. Alright, part two. Ready? How would you draw this? Azure, three sheaves of wheat, or. Alright, here's my take on it. Were you close? Traditionally, when you have an uneven number of charges, you put them in rows, with the larger number at the top, although most shields will never have more than six of something. Let's try something more complicated. Here's our second shield. Checky, or and azure, a bend gules. Go ahead and pause if you need a moment. Alright, how did you do? I think this one looks quite nice, personally. Last one. Ready for a challenge? Or... A chief gules, three tortoes. This one might be a problem for some people. If you need a reminder on what a torteau is, you can go back to the charges section where we talked about roundels. Here's your answer. If you were tripped up wondering where the torteaus went, you can usually bias yourself towards putting the charges on the field if the blazon doesn't say to put them somewhere else. Also, since torteaus are gules, you can't put them on the chief. Not only are they both colors, they're both the exact same tincture. So, how did you do? Don't worry if you missed any. We haven't had a lot of time to go over details, and this guide is really just here to give you a crash course in basics so you can get an idea for your world building. Bonus round! How would you blazon this one? 
Personally, I call it a bit much, but the blazing goes like this. Quarterly. First and fourth poly of six, or and sable, a bend, counterchanged. Second and third quartered argent and gules, across botany, counterchanged. It's a bit of a mouthful. So, how does heraldry fit in with world building, and what can you do with it? Well, there's a few ways, some of them more obvious than others. Maybe you're running a game of The Witcher, and you wanted to make a new coat of arms for a mercenary company. Or perhaps you're doing some homebrew building and wanted to describe a heraldic banner flying above the king's castle. Maybe you're painting minis for a game, and you wanted a shield with a little more panache to it. If you're an artist, or you're working with an artist to create illustrations of nobles and castles and armor, you'll probably want a coat of arms in mind to decorate with. But do you need to follow all the rules I laid out? Well, no. It's your world, and you don't have to follow any rules at all if you don't want to. But if you know the language of heraldry, you can talk about it, or have NPCs talk about it, in a way that sounds knowledgeable and authentic. And while you can certainly make up your own rules, people who spend a lot of time in your world analyzing it can tell the difference between when there are rules and when you just made it up. And people who play role-playing games tend to spend a lot of time analyzing the world. That's not at all to say you shouldn't change up anything about heraldry, but it's much easier to change up a rule or two from a set than it is to make everything up from scratch. So, how do you come up with the idea for a shield? What does the shield mean? That's one of the big questions everyone asks about heraldry. As far as we can tell from historical evidence, there was a lot of heraldry that people just chose because they thought it would look cool, or be easy to identify from a distance. So you can go ahead and give tinctures and charges whatever meaning you want, or decide they don't have any meaning at all and just look cool. Although there is one type of coat of arms where things do have meanings, and it's my favorite. Canting arms. Canting coats of arms are just puns, and they're much more common than you might first guess. For instance, Here's the Hopwell coat of arms. It certainly does make me think of hopping. Another one is the Kingdom of Castile y Leon. Castles and lions. I mean, yeah, what else would it be? A more obscure pun can be found in a story recorded by Nicholas Upton in the 15th century. He writes that a young squire lost his family jewels during a battle, and, when he was knighted for valor, was given the arms Argent, three ox heads kiboshed sable. Kiboshed means there's no neck, just the head. The reasoning for these arms was that since plow oxen are gelded, it would represent our unfortunate squire quite well. There's so much more we can go over, but we're already running long for what's supposed to be just an introduction video. Maybe I'll have to make a part two someday. In the meantime, I've got some research material for you. First, the Armorial Register has a searchable database of coats of arms if you want to take a look, as well as some resources for further reading. Keep in mind, the Register is not itself a heraldic authority, and so not every coat of arms is real, in the legal sense of the term. And yes, there are countries where coats of arms are still controlled by the government. The Heraldry Society is probably the foremost institution supporting the study and practice of heraldry, and they have documents and resources available for free that can provide information on the history and practice of the subject. If you want something older, I've left a link below to the Wikipedia article on the Camden Rule of Arms. The images there are of good quality, and might actually be able to give you some ideas for your own heroic adventures. Lastly, I've placed a link to Draw Shield down there. Draw Shield is a great tool for creating coats of arms, and it has some nice articles that can give you some reinforcement on rules and names. Go ahead, try it out, and leave a donation for the team if you like it. They're doing great work. And of course, if you want to support the library, or join our Discord, links have been posted below for your convenience. In the meantime, best of luck, researcher.